house right now. Lord, we just thank you right now for what you're about to do in this place, Lord. Come fill this place as only you can, Father. Lord, we just praise you for your song, for your word, for what you're about to do right here, right now, Father. So we give you all the glory this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. Give it. God's house. Come on. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert. Yeah. 
but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.
yesterday the words that came up out of my spirit was shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph for the Lord took the enemy and made a show of him openly triumphing him over in it he has already won the battle we need to declare before Almighty God this morning that they declare the victory is ours. The victory is ours. No sickness, no disease, no lack, no family situation. Nothing can come against you. You need to shout with a voice of triumph this morning. Begin to shout to Him. You may not see it yet in the natural, but begin to shout to Him with a voice of triumph. With a voice of triumph. With a voice of triumph. David come before the Goliath and he had stood before the armies of the Lord of Israel for days and he decried upon them to come forth and fight and no one would and it was that young boy that was David who came and he come before him and he said I don't come before you in might and armour my flesh but I come against you in the name of the Lord and in the name of the Lord this morning, it doesn't matter what would stand before you, what giant is before you. You need to know that as you come before that giant, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all gods, almighty God, holy, everlasting Father, you begin to come this morning and you begin to come with triumph. And you say, I don't care what you say. I don't care who you are. You cannot stand before almighty God. I come to you now in the name of Almighty God and with these words of my mouth we will tear the enemy's stronghold down in Jesus' name. More praise Him, praise Him, try out from over it. As we are uh, praising the Lord, I just want everyone to stare at that screen up there. And as you can see, the little white particles, those are your words. And your words shape your life. As you can think of this new year, as you go into the new year, what are you saying to yourself? What are you saying to the Lord? Are you speaking the Word of God? Are you speaking fear? Are you speaking doubt? Are you speaking unbelief? Or are you speaking what the Word of God says? Are you standing with the Word of God? and staring at the devil and saying, this is what my Bible says. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. This is what my father says. This is the covenant of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And as we speak that, that's going into the atmosphere. It's destroying what the enemy has put before you. And God has given you life and life in abundance. Life. Amen. Amen. change God but I don't know about you but on the inside bring it on bring it on bring it on oh it's a fight you want fight you're gonna get and when the dust settles it settles as brother Jerry said me and the Lord be standing you and the Lord will be standing you and the Lord will be standing no weapon formed against you can prosper 
It may have been formed, but it cannot prosper. So today, as we go into that new year, as we begin to declare the goodness of God, the grace of God, we need to know the victory is assured. Because you know what? Read the end of the book. We win. We win. We win. We win. You know, I heard a, a you know, I, I, I love the NFL. There was a famous uh, uh, NFL coach, Vince Lombardi, who said, you know what? I've never lost a game. He said, but that's impossible. No, no, no. We just ran out of time. We never lost. You cannot lose if you don't give up. You cannot lose if you refuse to quit. You cannot lose because greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. You ready to start for? Woo. Oh, God is good. Amen. Why don't you turn around to somebody and tell them God is good. Welcome to church. Oh, hallelujah. The final whistle is not gone. Hallelujah. Give your praise, Jesus. Come on. Woo, get excited. Get excited. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful Jesus. Oh, wonderful Lord. Oh, wonderful Savior. Mighty Jesus. Oh, wonderful Lord. Hallelujah. Need to welcome everybody here this morning, and if you're watching my live stream, just wonderful. Have you all passed your communion cups down to the end of the row? Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. He's got good to us, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Nice to have Nick and Marcel back with us, hey? Amen. Good to see him again. Yeah, Buddy, you, you okay? Hello, I'm, I'm not going to waffle even though I'm not preaching. Hey, Uncle Tony, are you all right? It's no good too late to study your notes now, buddy. Hey, yeah. man, the exam's on. Come on, man. Oh, my brother, my brother. Okay, <laughs> welcome to you all. Nice to see you. Hey, good to see you. Welcome. How was overseas? Is it good? <laughs> Sorry, beginning of the new year. You know, you can have fun in church. Lovely to have your mum here. Welcome. Welcome. This lady over there on the end of the row with the red hair. Anybody else you haven't seen before? We've seen her all before. Hallelujah. Is anybody? What? What are you talking? Stop talking in the front row. Are oh, you please, man? But we're so glad to have you all with us. Isn't good? Oh, and Sonia's friend. Nice to have you with us. Well, behind you, Sean. It's okay. So you think I didn't recognize that? Huh? And Sean. Sean's been with us for years. Just doesn't come very often, but he's been with us for years. No, he doesn't. No, Sean actually works up the Sunshine Coast. So if you don't see him here, he goes to, to somewhere else on a Saturday night. Then we get all that other teaching out of him on a Sunday morning when he comes here. Amen. No, it's nice to have you with us, man. Glad you're not working today. So, I'm waffling, aren't I? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm not. No, I'm okay. Sean, we're going to do the announcements. And then... No, no, for nothing. Okay. Just a few announcements quickly. Church office reopens tomorrow. That's Monday. Woo! Prayer this Tuesday, 7 p.m. That's the highlight of the week. Not today. <laughs> no, I encourage you all to come along on, on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We have an awesome time and God is doing great things. And we're going to see better things this year. After the service, 15 minutes. Okay, as long as no one talks, no gender spoken about there. But the 18 to 40 year olds, and your IDs will be checked at the door. Okay, 18 to 40 years old, I just need you for 15 minutes, please. We'd appreciate your time there. And then Jacqueline, just give us a wave if you can see her afterwards to confirm. But this Thursday, between 10 and 2 p.m., she will be um, carrying on with her life group. <laughs> I lost the word. Okay, so just see her afterwards. She'll give you the highlight. So, who's doing the offering? Hey, Russ. (laughs) 
Yeah. Good night, church. Happy New Year. Um, if we can get the guys to bring it. I just have an, a short encouragement for you guys. At the start of this year, I was reading uh, Jerry Seville's bit of a prophecy for 2015. It says, uh, it'll be known as the year of visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations. Experiencing the greater glory is still my plan. And you'll see the great I am shall visit your land. Manifestations of my spirit as never before. And demonstrations of my power from shore to shore. Supernatural provision and greater breakthroughs too. Yes, this is my plan and my will for you. The powers of darkness will no longer stand, for I will show them the strength of my right hand. I'll have my way and all shall see. No power is greater or equal to me. My people will rise up and take their place and no enemy shall stop them from finishing their race. Yes, 2015, you will surely see it will be a year that will go down in history. So lift up your hands and boldly decree that something greater is about to happen to me. It's pretty cool, that one. One of the things that Bible teaches is how powerful God is. God's got some muscles. Now, people used to say, you know, God is the opposite to the devil. The opposite to the devil is an angel. God has no class. He exists in a class on his own. The Bible says that when he looked to his left, he sees no peers. When he looks to his right, there is no one in that class. He stands alone. He is eternal in duration. He exists from the past, beginning, and the end. He's already there. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel that when he saw him, when Ezekiel saw God, he said he's a fire from the waist up. He's a fire from the waist down. And in his hands are great shafts of splendor, wherein is the hiding place of his power. The Bible says that when he forgive you, he didn't just scribble out the handwriting, he wiped out the ink. Now, the Bible says when David said, he said, my cup runneth over. That's what David said. And this is my interpretation of that. Every time David had an expectation of God to move in his life, God didn't just fill his cup, his cup overflowed. In other words, whatever your expectation of God this year, he's not just going to meet it, he will overflow it. So the question that I want to ask you this year is, what size is your cup? You want a small? You want a medium? You want a jumbo? It's up to you. But God's not going to just fill that cup. He'll make it overflow. So why don't you stand up and let's get ready to give an offering and set us in the right mood for this year. Bring up, uh, if you can bring up the offering cups and let's pray for that. Thank you, Father. Why don't you lift your hands towards the offering cups. Father, I thank you for this year. Lord, we dedicate this year of 2015 into your hands. Lord, every household that's represented in this place, every family, every, every business, every idea, dreams, Lord. Lord, every person that's in this um, church organization right now, Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing upon the gifts given, Lord. I pray breakthroughs this year, supernatural provisions this year, promotions this year, Lord, favor this year, unprecedented favor upon the lives and the members of this organization, of, of this church, Father. Lord, I pray the angels of heaven to go forth now and begin to make things come to pass, Lord. And Lord, I pray for a divine, in, a divine expectations this year. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's thank you, team. We had uh, Tony's going to come preach. And I think sometime in, uh, towards the end of February, Russell is also going to preach. Amen. Fire. Fire, 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 fire. Amen. <laughs> nice to have you here. Uh, Tony's going to share the word with us this morning. Yeah, okay, the boot? Yep. Is someone better to turn him on, hey? Yeah, I'm on. Yep. Praise God. Amen. God is good. I brought the bottle because it's easier because when you're like me, you end up trying to take a sip of water and you cover yourself in a whole glass of water. And, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Lighten up, we're in church. <laughs> we're in the house of God. If you come to my table, there's nothing but laughter, joy, fun, good time in the Holy Ghost. And that's how church should be. If you don't like what I'm saying, raise your hand and say, that's nonsense. If you like what I'm, what I'm saying, raise your hand and say, amen, brother. Amen. Okay, now we've got participation. God is good. You know, when I walked in here this morning, first of all, let me welcome Livestream. We know that you're watching with us, and uh, I'm trusting God that I can preach the best sermon I've ever preached in my life. 
Isn't that good? Because it's going live. And who knows where it ends up? It could be somewhere in America. So God is good. So what I was saying is that when I came into the house of the Lord this morning, Pastor Ian looked at me and he said, have you got the fire in you? And I, I just stuck a double check on me and I thought, I've got the fire in me. I've always got the fire in me, but actually I don't. And I did a check in my spirit. Do I have the fire on me? And uh, I said, Lord, I better start praying the fire. I better get some fire here. <laughs> I better get some fire because, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't want to be standing up here and not have any fire in you. Man, you end up preaching a boring sermon that will put people to sleep. Isn't that true? And so with the result is, I came in here and I said, Lord, I am preaching under the first dispensation of grace in my own life for a specific season and time. You see, I've been through a period in my life that I have died to myself like I have never seen in my life. And I won't go into that story because it is deep and I'll have every single one of you weeping in tears. Just some, something for thought. And so I'm not going to go down that line, but I stood here and I thought, Lord, I'd like to preach your word, and I'd like to know that you are with me as I came into this place empty as a vessel ready to be filled by your fire, by your blood, and by the new dispensation of new wine that has been set aside for myself at this season. And the Lord said to me, I'll be there. So when you step up onto this pulpit, I will be there. And I said, but Father, I always look for signs. Give me a sign. And then the Lord said to me, I'll give you a sign. And so while I was standing over there, funny enough in that chair, and if Kath stands up, you'll probably see, so I can show you that this is no spiritual jargon. It's just a sign for me. That while I was standing there, the light that comes off the, the main auditorium shines down at the correct angle so that when you raise in your hand, then the light splits you into three shadows. And the Lord says, you have always acknowledged me as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today, I will be with you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I said, that's a good enough sign for me. I said, thank you, Father. And so when I step up here now, I want you to understand, I didn't step up here. And Ian's right. He says, it's too late. <laughs> because if you hear my children, they say, Dad, what are you preaching on? I said, I don't know. I don't know. So my wife says to me, what are you preaching on? I said, I don't know. I'll tell you when I got it. So last night, probably at about nine o'clock, I think, I said, Kat, okay, put the, put the computer on and, and just print what I've put out here. So we'll see where the Lord leads us. So once in my prophecy, the Lord said to me, one thing you will always preach on is about the righteousness of God. And isn't it ironic that as I woke up this morning, whoever read my Facebook page will see that it says, be holy as I am holy. And so I posted that and I said, wow, this is interesting. Be holy as I am holy. And so this morning, you're going to hear the first sermon under this dispensation of 30 years of ministry that was stripped, eradicated, chucked in the dustbin, thrown away, had a death attached to it, and resurrected to the first of the new fruits in Christ. So, Father, I thank and praise you this morning. I thank you, Lord, as this word goes out through life stream, as your word begins to take root. I thank you, Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus of Nazareth. I thank you, Almighty Abba, our Father, that today we become an instrument of your praise and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. A religious woman upon waking up each morning would open up her front door and stand on the porch and scream, praise the Lord. This infuriated her atheist neighbor who would always make sure to counter attack. There is no Lord, you fool. One morning, the atheist neighbor overheard that the neighbor was praying for food. Father, just give me some food. I thank you, Lord, that I can trust you for the food that comes upon my table. 
Can you imagine an atheist standing on the side and saying, look at this. He went down to the shop, this atheist, and he brought her all sorts of groceries and left them on the, on the porch. The next morning, the lady screamed, praise you, Jesus, you've delivered my food. Well, the atheist turned back and he said, listen, man, there is no God. I bought the food, sucker. And so the woman turned and she said, oh, God, this is even more of a miracle. You get the atheist to buy my food. The Bible says, any man who has not God is a fool. Isn't that true? That God will use the donkey to bring milk, bread. I'm reminded about a story that, uh, or, or, or a situation that happened to me about a week and a half ago. Uh, this man walked into my house and uh, he looked around and he, uh, he started to make a comment. And he said, uh, I wanted to give him a book just to say, listen, this is, this is interesting reading. I'm a born again, spiritual Christian. I walk by the blood of Jesus. So he wouldn't take my book because he was Muslim. And so he turned to the side and he said, uh, oh, I, I believe in the same thing you believe in. Muhammad and Jesus are the same prophets. And I said, Lord, my sword is out to attack. And Jesus said to me, not like Simon and Peter, put your sword back. He said, for you know of not what spirit you have. And so the Lord arrested me and told me to keep quiet. Because you cannot preach to a fool if his heart isn't open to listen. Do you understand? And so he tells me Muhammad and Jesus are the same. And so as he left, I just jumped on Facebook and I printed and I said, Muhammad never raised from the dead. Jesus did. Muhammad was not born of a virgin Mary. Jesus was born of a virgin. Muhammad never shed blood for the unrighteous. Jesus Christ did. And I posted this. And I said, and most of all, Muhammad died and never resurrected from the dead. Jesus did. I said, they cannot be the same. So I just wanted to settle that in the spirit realm. That they are not the same God. And perhaps today when I preach, you'll understand. And so... I just want to acknowledge Pastor Ian, Diane, the team. We have a wonderful team coming into, uh, into fruition and into play for this ministry, and this ministry is going to change. We're looking to talk to you and see you grow with us like you've never seen. So, Ian, the change that you've had in this ministry, God is going to reward us tremendously because the pillars of strength that are in the house. I also want to say thanks to Nico and Marcel. So good to see you guys with us. We've missed you. We really have missed you. You need to know that. You've been missed. And I believe that God is going to do a new thing now. Because, you know, when you start to put foundations down with pillars, you can really build a building that is huge. And so I just want to acknowledge the leadership, the elders, and everybody in this ministry. God is going to do some supernatural things. Now, let's get down to the Word of God. I want to... Lay a foundation here, and I want you to understand that my preaching today is the difference between understanding the word righteous and the word righteousness. Say this after me. Righteous, righteous. and righteousness are two different things. Completely two different things. So the word righteousness is an adjective. It means morally justified. That's the blood of Jesus that was shed for you on Calvary. Morally justified. In him, it was done. It was completed. It was settled. And it was justified through the shedding of the blood. You can do nothing, add nothing, take away nothing, finished. Boom. Nailed to the cross. Righteous means to carry the character of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this carefully. The character of Jesus Christ means that there needs to be a personality of traits that follows righteous action. 
Justified, settled, complete. Nailed to the cross. Victory of Christianity begins with the name of Jesus on your lips. But will only be consummated when the character of Jesus Christ is in your heart. If there is no character through righteous actions of the blood, the character of Jesus, there can be no victory. Adjective. Righteousness is a noun. It's a doing word. That means it carries with it some principles. It says, adhere to, stick to firmly, be loyal to, be devoted to. And the key is to walk in its moral principles. Two different things completely. Nailed to a cross, finished. All are made righteous. When you call upon the name of Jesus Christ, you are made righteous. I love what, uh, what you said this morning about Jesus doesn't only forgive you of your sins and rewrite the book, but he scratches the ink out and he gives you a clean page. But from that second on, you begin to take the pen and begin to scribe out the new scroll for your own life. And so Jesus eradicated it on the cross. But now I step in and I open up the scrolls and I begin to rewrite the volume of the books that have been given to me. And I'm not talking about the spiritual volume of the God that has given you the information to carry on with your life. I'm talking about how I'm going to now stand before the throne of justice. And so let's look at Matthew 5 verses 19. For I say unto you, says Jesus, the words of Messiah, Messiah, that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. What? I thought by grace, everything is sorted. But the words of Messiah, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMashiach, stops and he looks. Remember, Jesus spoke what his father spoke, did what his father did. He never had the Bible. He never had Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Acts, Romans. He never had that. He was the living epistle. He stopped and he said this, unless your righteousness... Not being righteous through my blood. He said, unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you shall no way enter nor see the kingdom of God. I love this, uh, this guy, and maybe you should take, take this down and, and record this. Avi ben Mordecai made this valuable statement. He says, I've come to at least one undeniable conclusion for a long time now that a nation's behavior is guided by its philosophies. And a nation's philosophy is formed by its religious values. Wow, did you get that? Should I repeat that? He says this, I have come to at least one, the undeniable conclusion. He said, for a long time now, a nation's behavior is guided by its philosophies. What's its philosophical status that we stand on in this country? Can I tell you? There is no religion. There is no belief. It's funny now that ISIS are running rampant and wanting to kill everybody, that everybody's saying, oh, what's happening? You see, religion is one of the demonic forces upon the face of this earth and smacks with the worst evil you could ever dream of. It kills in the name of its God and its prophets. So its philosophical status, a nation's behavior is guided by its philosophy. And a nation's philosophy is formed by its religious Values. What's the religious values of our lives in our family and our status that we stand on right now? 
Where do we stand from a religious point of view? Here, I've come to this conclusion. I don't care what I stand for in this place, but I stand. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of whom his son is Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, through his Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. And I keep using the Jewish words because there is such confusion as to what churches believe in now and what method and what system they follow. This is a vast difference between under the law and being led by the Spirit. For first of all, we know that the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. See, if I held the Word of God to you and smacked you on the head with it, the letter would kill you. But if I comfortably spoke out God's Word to you, life would come in abundance and there'd be a transformation of your soul. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7, 17, Paul concludes with saying, Now, where God is, where Yahweh, Yahweh, Have is, the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Why is there no liberty on the face of this earth to, to worship God? You see, because what's happened is there is a law abiding factor that people don't understand between the difference of law and grace. And so it's important for us to come back and re straighten the chassis and bring the church back into its alignment because the church has run off into fables and doctrines that are foolish to man. The law is similar to a sharp knife. Listen to this very carefully. The law is similar to a sharp knife. If it is used for what it was designed for, it will serve you. If it is used for murder, then it will be the most damning piece of evidence that you've ever, or that has ever stood against you. And we are reminded clearly of the story or, or, or the news break yesterday with the eight children that were laid to rest. The knife was used out of perspective. The law is exactly the same. Grace is exactly the same. You see, when they are placed in its correct perspective, it will bring the right understanding and the correct determination as to what we're going to do with it. We also need to understand that the difference between the law and Torah are two different things. Torah is the spoken word of God. It is the instructions given down from Elohim, Abba, our father, to Moses to bring the understanding of how to conduct your life. Whereas the law was the 1,200 plus rabbinical structures slapped into Leviticus that you and I cannot keep. There's a big difference. There's a huge difference. Now what happens is in life as people have taken the difference between the law and the rabbinical law and have failed to understand the instructions from God of how to live our lives and how to walk in the understanding of the King of Kings. See, God gave us the Ten Commandments. He didn't give us the Ten Laws. He said, these commandments you need to follow and understand them and honor them. And you'll see the different things come in your life. And he said, oh, not only that, he says, through love and through peace, through understanding, through grace, you will have what I have perfected to give you. Nowhere in life can anybody walk around killing another person for the sake of his God. This is a demon God. See, my point is that I speak the difference between righteous and righteousness. And I will keep reiterating that so we get the understanding. There are two different entities here. Matthew 5 verse 6 says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It doesn't say blessed are they that's hunger and thirst to be righteous. You're made righteous. It says to hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The Word of God is established in righteousness. In Psalms uh, 33 verses 4 and 5, the Word of Jehovah is right. And all His works are done in faithfulness. Five, He loves the righteousness and the justice. 
And the earth is full of his loving kindness. Why would God take so much time in trying to explain the difference himself? In 2 Corinthians 5 verses 20, 21, the righteousness of God is understood by this statement that the righteousness of the body which passed on has given us an account to heaven because, number one, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We are transformed Brand new people living under a blood shed covenant which renews us. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16. Every scripture is inspired of God and is also profitable for the teaching, for the reproof, for the correction, for the instruction in righteousness. And again, this is about how we disciple ourselves and how we conduct ourselves. Yeah, Paul states that the instructions for righteousness is for righteousness and not to be righteous. In verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. Now, isn't this funny? The man who wrote about law and grace now says that righteousness may furnish you unto every good work. And yet, grace tells you, I'm not talking about true grace, I'm talking about hyper grace. Hyper grace tells you that there are no works. We'll come to more conclusion of this now. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 says this For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine anymore, but having itching ears, will reap for themselves teachers after their own lusts, and will turn away their ears from the truth. And turn aside to fables of destruction and lies that you and I would be sucked into without thinking. There will come a time when the world will be better still. Christians will receive false doctrines. The first thing that will show through are their fruits of behavior. Wow. Now I say unto you. Christianity is another religion. Boom! That was a pork chop through a Jewish synagogue. That's just a statement. That's not, it's just, just, that means that that just went through so fast nobody saw it. You understand what I'm saying? Christianity is just another religion. And after today, I hope that I'm going to drive something into you that you will understand the difference between discipleship and Christianity. Because there are Christians killing people. There are Christians doing the most abominable things that it remains to be seen how we can even call ourselves by this name. Whereas a disciple carries the character of righteousness and discipline. Disciple comes from the word disciplined one. Not works, because I can guarantee you, I don't walk around slapping myself. I don't nail myself to a cross. I don't, 20, I don't have 45 Hail Marys. I don't have any of that trash. Not by any works, but by grace through the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to resurrect. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 to 10, even him whom choosing, or sorry, whom coming is after the works of Satan with all power and signs of lying wonders. And verse 10 says this, and all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Wow. Wow. In them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. It's so much easier to make excuses why we don't have to reconvert and have a death and a resurrection. What's the love of truth? I posted it this morning. Jesus said this. It came up on on my reading, on my Bible readings this morning. It says, be holy as I am holy. Walk in righteousness. 
Not being righteous. See, because we're all righteous. We all carry the blood of Jesus. Any man who confesses Jesus Christ as his personal savior is made righteous through that blood. But not everybody walks in righteousness. You see, the church, Ecclesia, the Ecclesia, us, looks and smells and talks like the world. There is no standout man. You know, we, we're calling out here, just to, just to commercial break quickly. We're calling out here for people to be dedicated and fit into the house of God and to lay down themselves and die to themselves. But instead, they run after fables. They run after hype. They run after what they think is the anointing so that they can stand in places and be recognized. How about dying to yourself and saying, I stand before God in the service of the King of Kings. How about standing here and let's begin to disciple others and bring them into a place where they'll get to understand who the true Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is. And so there is no standout men there are no standout women. Everybody wants to go where the crowd's going. Everybody wants to be amongst those that, that, that are following these, these little slap you anointings and spit in the eye and boom. You know, I know. Listen, Jesus is Jesus. If you want healing, he will heal you right where you are. If you, want to, if you want to change in your life, he will transform you in a split second. This is a living God. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who parted the Dead Sea, the Red Sea. This is that God. This isn't the God that we're talking about that follows funny uh, uh, religious practices that get you absolutely nowhere. You see, it's about time we straighten up the chassis of the kingdom. It's about time we brought back what Christ died on the cross for. You see, in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 9 to 10, even him who's coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs of lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. I repeated that scripture for a purpose. You see, Paul calls us to be the first fruits of those that are saved. He said, the first fruits of sanctification, separation, justification, made clean through his blood. He didn't, Paul didn't call us to say, you're now saved, let's join the world and let's do what we want to do. And let's be who we want to be. He didn't do that. He said there is a price to pay. There is a price to pay. And what's happened is the world has cheapened the blood of Jesus. The world has cheapened it to such a state that a man can stand in my house and tell me that Muhammad is the same as Jesus. Come on. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 12, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth. Wow. He said that they might all be damned that do not believe the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But he had pleasures, he that hath pleasures in unrighteousness. So he says this, and let me read that again. That they may all be damned who believed not the truth and had pleasures in unrighteousness. Not being, un being righteous. This, is, this, this, I'm afraid, is broccoli. This, I'm afraid, is what those little cabbage balls. Brussels sprouts. Ugh. This is that word where we buckle in and we take the knock on the chin to say, hold on a second, I better go back and reevaluate my life. See, that's what I love about the shepherd of the house. The shepherd will always come back and say, whoa, the broccoli was terrible. The Brussels sprouts were ugly. Let's put some gravy on. And he just softens the word and brings it back into perspective. That's why you don't find me preaching up here every Sunday. Hello. You understand what I'm saying? Am I okay, Pastor? 
verse, uh, um, Romans chapter 1, verses 21, verses 33. And it speaks of all demon practices such as worshiping false gods. Now, I'd like to do an evaluation. See, because let's face it, all of us have been sinners and are saved by grace. All of us. Trust me. I am like Paul, the chiefest of sinners. In fact, just last week, if, I had a, if, if God wasn't the graceful father he is, he would have fed me to the sharks. You understand what I'm saying? Because I was in such deep, deep sin. Don't worry, it wasn't sex. It wasn't pornography. It wasn't any of this. It was just pure lack of faith to believe that God can. Ah, yes. oh, I don't know if I'm talking to the right church here. Is this the Holy Ghost Church? Yes. Are you sure? Do you get this? Do you get this place? You know where we stand and say, God, if you're there, drop a gold bar. And you walk, and you walk away and you've got to go and pay the bill and you don't know how to. And the gold bar never fell. See, so we stand there we, let's, let's just be real. Let's just be real. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Let's just be real. And so it speaks of all demon practices such as worshiping false gods of the universe, homosexuality, lesbianism. I say that loud <laughs> so that I'm not politically correct, but that I'm correcting Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of all. Jesus loves the homosexual. My brother was a homosexual. I loved him with all my heart and soul. And he died in my arms. Born again, spirit filled, loved Jesus. Never agreed to his practices. Ever. He loves him. God loves him and he's seated with the Father because he confessed, believed, and transformed. He loves the lesbians. But the word of God is the infallible truth. I don't care if this goes viral. And they whip me. It's time, Christians, to stand up for your religious rights. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Not being politically correct. Pastor, if I'm losing it, just pull me off the stage. Thank you, my brother. But he says this, we are bound. Oh, hold on. Let's just go back to Romans 1, verse 21, verse 33. And it speaks of all kinds of demon practices, such as worshiping false gods. Hello, the God of the universe. This universe can't do nothing for you. If I stand here and I say, Millie, grow. Corn, grow. And I don't plant a seed. You will not see corn. The universe can do nothing. It is a vessel given by God, the creator, not the created, to give you what you require. And he says this, such as worshiping false gods of this universe, homosexuality, lesbianism, drunken behaviors, adultery, and lying, gossiping. Oh, gosh, did you hear what that pastor said? He's nuts. <laughs> Hatred, strife, emulence, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And this is the list that we do evaluate ourselves as disciples, not as Christians. Because as a Christian, Christ says, Hyper grace says, we can do these things. Jesus says, unless there is a death, there can be no resurrection. And so I'm going to have to come and conclude my message. How many minutes have I got this morning? Ten minutes. Wow, I can preach two sermons because I didn't know I was going to go down this route. In Thessalonica, Paul challenges these people about their doctrine. As Satan has led them to this false grace message, the message is with us. That there are no works to be born again. 
And yet the doctrines are exactly as today a deception has come into the body. As the Holy Spirit is the power to walk away from sin. The Holy Spirit is the grace manifest of the cross to move you through power away from sin. See, John on the Isle of Patmos reprimands the churches for tolerating the doctrines of Balaam and Balak. Whoa, Christians, have you heard that? Balaam and Balak. You want to do a good study, go home and study what the doctrines of Balaam and Balak are about. This is something else. When you begin to listen to the doctrines of Balaam and Balak, just look around at society and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. You see, there are no works of unrighteous deeds. Done. Nailed to the cross. Blood. Done. Finished. But there are, and I reiterate this for my brothers online, in the airways. There are works of Righteousness. See, one needs to understand the difference between righteous works and unrighteous works. I said to you, unrighteous works, 40 Hail Marys, whipping on the back, crawling for, for 10 kilometers on your knees, crying out, oh God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Nothing. Unrighteous works, it was settled, settled nailed to the cross. You can't do anything. Forty Hail Marys, rabbinical laws, structures, sackcloth, burning, dusting yourself, putting on funny clothing, blow rockies. That means blue dresses, you know. This is some of these funny cults that they can only wear blue or pink or green. I don't know. Just get some color in your life. Sacrifices on altars. It's done, settled, sealed. Jesus was the ultimate. Always been under pressure to perform. You can't. You just cannot do it. But let's look at the righteous works. Simply abstaining from sin. Wow. Which, when you look at sin, means missing the mark. See, the difference between David and and us is that David was quick to repent. But he didn't go on and find another Bashir. And he didn't go on and kill another Uriah. You understand? He repented. He carried the consequences for his sin. And so God said, a man after my own heart, he's repented. This is my son. He didn't go back and continue in his sinful nature. That's ludicrous. Miss the mark because you I want to please God. You see, I want to live a holy and a beautiful life and a loving walk with Jesus because I love him. It's like my relationship with Kat, and I relate this every time I preach, I think. You must have heard this a hundred times, but bear with me one more time. See, I love my wife so much that I don't go and sleep with a prostitute. See, the reverential fear of love between us, the law of love, the knife, that if it's used right, keeps us together. Whereas if it was wrong, I'd be ending up killing someone and using it incorrect and sleeping with someone else. So I have reverential love relationship, fear that I do not hurt my wife and that we keep our relationship pure so we can walk in this Beautiful instruction given by God. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Isn't it funny that Jesus said, well, I'll tell you a greater law than this. He says that any man who looks upon another woman to lust has already committed adultery in his heart. So the sacrificial lamb comes with a higher instruction than the Ten Commandments. Wow. Wow. See, 
Romans 3 verses 6 to 8 says, it's been made ministers of a New Testament through righteousness. We are made ministers through righteousness who hath also made us to be ministers of a New Testament. And in this scripture, if I break it down quickly for time, it says that the law was laid down on tablets. And when Moses fetched the law, he shone with the radiance of God. And so the law brought with it a show, an open show of the glory of God. Then Paul goes on to state, but how much more who are we who have the blood of Jesus the Holy Spirit indwelling in us should have a better illumination showing forth to the world a better understanding, a brighter glow than Moses of the Old Testament or Old Covenant and us who are under the brand new blood of Jesus. You are a lighthouse for Christ. How can we go into the world and sacrifice and do silly things and behave in un, unmerited, favorable patterns that, that the rest of the world look at and say, oh, hold on a second, this boy's preaching about Jesus, but man, he's also getting drunk with us. And this boy's preaching about Jesus, but man, look at him, how he looks at the chick, he's undressing her. And this, the, and this woman, she's preaching about Jesus, but listen how she swears. Well, what kind of light are you portraying to the world? What illumination are you showing? Hey, I'm not a, some religious freak, man. Do me a favor. I come from the deepest sinful nature of life. I am redeemed by the blood. When I was redeemed, there was a death, a resurrection, and a newness of life. There is a show and tell. You don't find me sitting around in the pubs. If I go and I'm sitting in the pubs, you won't hear me swearing. You won't see me drinking. You won't see me undressing woman. You will see me talking. Good, wholesome subjects about God. Now, I don't put my arm around you and judge you for what you're doing, but I'm going to help you get out of the destruction you're in. You see, being made ministers of a New Testament through righteousness. So that our glory is seen way better than what the world should be seen. For even that which was glorious had no glory in respect, but by reason of that glory which is seen in us through being the lighthouse. I love what Luke says. It says, be careful that the light, the Holy Spirit within you is not in darkness. Because let's face it, when the ship is coming to the lighthouse and the lighthouse's light is not on, the ship runs aground. Galatians 5 verse 16 says it, but I say this, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. You cannot mix the two. Hello. You either walk in the flesh or you carry the fruits of the spirit, but you can't mix the two. For the spirit and, and, and the flesh are against each other, contrary to one another, that you may, that you may do the things that you would but that if you are led by the Spirit, then you are no longer under law. You see, there's a big difference by being led by the Spirit, then you are no longer under the law. So if you're not led by the Spirit of God, then you're under the law. Oh, should we say that again? So if I'm not led by the Spirit of God, then I place myself under the law. Hello? God doesn't place you under the law. Come on, Nick. This doesn't take rocket science. Wow. So I want to give you this opposite. So if I am not led by the Spirit, then I put myself back under the law. Did you get that? If I am led by the Spirit, the right one, then I'm not under the law. But if I am not led by the Spirit, then I put myself back under the law. Not God put you there. Not Jesus. You do. See, it's exactly the same as this. The murderer goes out, kills someone, serves his time, 17 years, pays the price, pays the penalty. He slapped himself under the law. 
He slapped himself on the schoolmasters. He paid the price. And then the day of reconciliation comes. And they say, you've been a good man. We are now letting you out. He now comes out of the law into this grace of favor through walking out of the law. And he walks straight out and he murders someone else. Did the officers catch him, put him back into jail? Or did his actions and consequences bring him back to jail? I rest my case. Verse 19. Now the works, the works of the flesh are these that are manifest. Fornication. This is, this is, this is the yardstick. Fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness. Whew, big word. Lasciviousness. You want to know what lascivious is? I'll tell you what it is. It's laying with a male or a female, that's not your husband or wife, on Burley Beach and becoming so sexy that you're engaging in sexual practices visibly before everybody else and you don't care. Whoa. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, wrath, factions, divisions, envying, drunkenness, party spirits. Doesn't mean you can't go to parties. Hold on. Come back down to earth. See, I love going to a good party. I love going to Cooley Rocks. But I want to tell you, when I pitch up at Cooley Rocks, the demons know. Let's just make way for this boy. Let's just make way for this boy. You understand what I'm saying? I don't partake. Jesus Christ never came to drink. You, you got it wrong. Go back and study the Hebrew about Christ. He came to be amongst the wine bibbers. You see, otherwise the scripture in Hebrew is eradicated that says he was tested in every way yet without sin. See, because if he turned the water from Canaan into wine, there were already a rocking party going for it, already supposed to be inebriated, and here comes Savior and makes them more drunk. So they sleep with each other, they swear at each other, they fight with each other, they become confused. Where did you get this false doctrine? Hello? Pure, 100% oinos. Pure grapefruit, unfermented, changed miraculously in a split second of time. For the fruit, now, I just want you to know that what I just read out there are works. These are things you actually have to go and do. Emily strife, murder, hatred, sleeping around, drinking, swearing, cursing, cussing, whatever, killing. Those are works. They are practices that one actually has to go and do. Well, let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. Against these things, there is no such law. Isn't that wonderful? So, but if we live in the Spirit, we're not under the law because we walk in the fruits of the Spirit. Now, isn't it, under, isn't it good to understand that the law has works that you have to do, but the Spirit has fruits that are cultivated through the blood, through the actions, through the Spirit of God, through the way that we're to conduct ourselves as Christians. Sorry, as disciples. Points that I tell you is that any person who repents needs to carry signs and wonders with them. And so, in conclusion, Luke chapter 6, verse 46 says this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I tell you? Luke 8, verse 21 says this. But he answered them, Behold, my mother and my brothers are those who hear my words and do them. Luke 11, verse 28 says this. Blessed, rather, are those who hear the words of of God and keep them. John 8 verse 51 says this, Truly, truly, I say unto you that anyone who keeps my word, he will never see death. 
John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 15, 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in me and produce good fruits, not works. For it is God who works in you, both to the will and for the good of all in pleasure. See, are we going to give up and listen to the myths and fables found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3? Giving ourselves over to itchy ears that please our own lives so that one day when we stand before the throne of justice, because justice shall come. See, God is a God of love. He's a God of peace. He's a God of structure. He's a God of order. Because if justice weren't to come, then ISIS and myself and you will be found entering into the fold of Jesus. Because they believe that they believe in the same God. You see, if justice wasn't going to be served, then every demonic, evil, religious practice where you have heard all roads lead to God, <clears throat> if justice were not served, there'd be a problem. Then murdering's okay. Then all the works of the flesh are okay. See, then Jesus never needed to be crucified. See, then the blood never needed to be shed. You see, and Jesus would have to eradicate hell. I think we have to go back and identify the difference between righteous and righteousness, law, and grace, a supernatural death and resurrection, to identify what yardstick do I measure myself in? Not someone else. I love what Dr. Jerry Savelle says this. He says, unless there be a death, there can be no resurrection. He says, you know, the, the funny thing is I've never seen a dead man sin. Think about that for a second. I've never seen a dead man heal the sword. I've never seen a dead man pick up a glass. I've never seen a dead man swear. Hey, don't get me wrong. We make mistakes. You see, unless there is a death, I cannot even begin to comprehend how the church cannot differentiate between the two. It's a fine bloodline. Grace was nailed to the cross. Righteousness came. He gave us a clean sheet. And then he said, go, be holy as I am. Walk in righteousness. Do what I have done. Say what I do. Do what I do. Let's just stand. You know, the Bible is very, very clear. It says, for there is no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. There is no guilt. Guilt. Condemnation is guilt for those that are in Christ Jesus. You see, I believe that the purpose of what God has chosen me to speak of, and I can tell you this, that Man, I wrestled. I wrestled for hours with the Lord saying, Lord, what on earth can I preach? I can tell them about my life story, about what I've done. But the Lord said, no, no, no. Sit down. I took one of my favorite topics, the kingdom of God. I prepared a sermon on the kingdom of God. And the Lord said, I don't want you to preach on that. At this time, at this place, in these minutes, God has said to me, I want you to preach 
on righteousness because my church has lost its truth and are listening to doctrines of demons doctrines of Balaam and Balak and have lost the concept but Jesus said this my children there is no condemnation for those his mercies are renewed every day his blood washes us every day And so as we stand before the Lord this morning, I don't want you to get anxious. You can just raise the music a little bit. I don't want you to get anxious because I'm just going to wait upon the Holy Spirit for a minute. Father, you said in your word that every day is a new day. And the sins of yesterday are pardoned, provided we don't habitually carry on with those sins. See, habit-forming sins are something that brings justification and justice. Sin, missing the mark, is something that gets eradicated by Jesus through His blood. First of all, while every head's bowed, I want everybody just to bow their head. You've never given Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. An opportunity to be the Lord of your life. You've never before man confessed Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Jesus said this one thing. He said, if you deny me before people, then I'll deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. But if you accept me before people, then I will announce you in the heavenlies before my Father. You see, this is an opportunity That you may have thought, well, I don't know if I'm born again or not. See, born again means, born again means, born again means, born again means a death, a burial, a resurrection. Behold, old things have passed away. All things become new. See, if you've never had that opportunity, then I'm going to say right now who I'm speaking to, there's a pounding going on in your chest. This man's talking to me. He's talking to me. Then I want you to raise your hand fast and put it down. Just raise it up and say, he's talking to me. I believe this man's talking to me today. Just raise your hand so I can see, then I'll pray for you afterwards. Don't be scared. Don't be shy. Don't be scared. See, the devil has a, a, has a motive. He's got a trick. He says, well, I'm too scared. I'm too scared to say this. Just raise your hand up. And just uh, be bold before the Lord because if your heart is knocking and there's a pounding and you've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, well, then you have a problem. Then you have a problem. See, many of us believed that we were Christians. I want to convert you from a Christian to being a disciple. See, I want to convert you from being a Christian to being a disciple. And so my second call now is that I thought I was walking with the understanding that I was doing things correct. And so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to wait up at the front here And I'm going to let you come forward and I'm going to pray over you. And I believe that this new wine that was poured into me is going to be imparted into you. And you're going to connect with the spirit of righteousness, not with the spirit of law. And it's going to take you to a new dimension with your walk with the Lord. Let's begin to sing. Let's begin to worship Him. Let's just begin to worship the Lord. As at this present moment, those that want to stay in the worship and get prayer, you'll come forward. The rest, I believe we can go out and just have coffee and just fellowship. And we're looking forward to you filling in those forms with Sean. 
and, uh, and moving in the, in the newness of God. So let's just worship the Lord. Those that want to come forward for prayer, just come forward. If you were too shy and you wanted to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, when you come to me, just tell me in my ear and I'll pray with you. Let's not give the devil an opportunity. Let's worship the Lord. Let's begin to worship Him. believe that God is doing something here and it's going to take some of us a bit of time to say hang on a second I'm actually sitting back and I'm not looking at this in the correct perspective let me just go back and readjust let me go back and readjust and as you do that God is going to honor you and he's going to meet you he's going to meet you listen to me I really I really I'm not looking for somebody to pray for I'm looking for somebody who wants a change in their life. That's what I'm looking for. Shut it up, Baba Yeah. 